Last episode was the year 1980. It kick-started off our decade in review, and we went over John Carpenter's The Fog. This episode is 1981, which means we are going to be talking about a horror movie from that year, and the one I've chosen for this one is My Bloody Valentine, which is by far one of my favorite holiday slasher films. I know it's not this holiday. <laughs> it's obviously not a Christmas movie. But it's a Valentine's Day movie, which I feel like it kind of counts because it's still a holiday of sorts. So let's talk about My Bloody Valentine. It is a 1981 Canadian slasher film. Shout out to my home country. <laughs> and it was directed by George Mahalka and written by John Beard. It stars Paul Kelman, Laurie Hollier, and Neil Affleck. The plot focuses on a group of young adults who decide to throw a Valentine's Day party, only to incur a vengeful wrath of a maniac who is in mining gear and goes on a complete killing spree. The director of the film, George Mahalka, was approached by Cinepex Productions with a two-movie contract. One of those movies was a horror slasher story that he was asked to direct. The film was originally titled The Secret, however, the producers decided to change it to My Bloody Valentine because they wanted to overtly reference the big holiday serial killer trend that was happening. Like we had Black Christmas in 1974, Halloween in 1978, Friday the 13th in 1980, there was also Prom Night in 1980, so there were tons of different movies that were focusing on different kind of dates and holidays throughout the year. Paul Kelman was cast in the lead role of the movie as TJ, while Neil Affleck was cast as Axel, who plays his former friend and co-worker. Laurie Hallier was then cast as Sarah, who plays the girlfriend of Axel and the ex-girlfriend of TJ. You can imagine where that's going to end up. Hallier actually arrived to the set several weeks after the other actors, because she had prior obligations at the National Theatre School of Canada, where she was studying at the time. The director, however, was super intent on casting her in the role, so he convinced her academic advisors to let her finish the semester early so she could appear in the film. Shooting on My Bloody Valentine started in September of 1980 and took place around the Princess Colliery Mine in Sydney Mines, Nova Scotia, which had closed in 1975. Filming then completed in November of 1980, with a budget that was approximately $2.3 million. And there were two mines that were considered for the setting of My Bloody Valentine. The other one was in Glace Bay, Nova Scotia. However, the production company decided on the Sydney Mines location because the exterior was a dreary, cold, and dusty area with no other buildings around. So it looked like it was completely in the middle of nowhere, which is the kind of vibe they wanted to go for in the movie. The director has said that since making My Bloody Valentine, the most difficult element of filming was filming in the mines because it was located 2,700 feet, which is 820 meters, underground. And filming in the mine was a lengthy process because they had limited space for the elevators, so it would take them an hour to transport the cast and crew to the location. So that's one hour of time alone just for transportation to the actual filming location. And then on top of that, because of the methane levels underground, the lighting had to be carefully planned as the number of bulbs that could be safely utilized for filming was limited, so they couldn't have anything that was going to cause an explosion, especially when you have high levels of methane around. <laughs> Prior to the production team's arrival to the mine, the owners had cleaned up the location significantly and left it, as it was described, a clean and colorful Disneyland-like set. That's, that's apparently how they described it. And this actually resulted in the production team spending about another $30,000 to paint portions of the mine because they needed to achieve a darker atmosphere because you're not going to have My Bloody Valentine in a very colorful <laughs> Disneyland-like set, right? So obviously they needed to achieve that darker atmosphere that we do see in the film. Something that was pretty cool too is that the crew kept the identity of the killer in the movie a complete secret to the cast members un until the end of production when the final scene was shot. And this was to make sure that the actors played their parts in a completely ambiguous manner. My Bloody Valentine was released and distributed in the United States by Paramount Pictures on February 11th, 1981, and then on February 13th, 1981 in Canada. The film went on to gross $5,672,031 at the US box office. Despite the fact though that My Bloody Valentine made money at the U.S. box office because the film's budget was only $2.3 million. 
So it obviously made money, but it was still considered a box office disappointment by Paramount Pictures because it only returned a sum of $3.3 million-ish. And it also amounted to less than one-third of the profit Paramount made off of Friday the 13th, which was released the year before. So they were comparing this to a classic like Friday the 13th. So I can understand their disappointment. Not that I think My Bloody Valentine's a bad movie in any way. It's definitely not. But it's not a Friday the 13th caliber movie. And I think we can all agree on that. When My Bloody Valentine was first released in North America, it was actually significantly censored in theaters. The Motion Picture Association of America awarded the movie an R rating, and cuts were also requested to every death sequence in the film. The producer of the film even said that the film was pretty much cut to ribbons so that they could just achieve an R rating. And even after cutting the film so that they could match the requirements by the Motion Picture Association of America, it was again returned with an X rating and further cuts were demanded from the film. And even today, the complete uncut version of My Bloody Valentine has not been released. The closest we got was a 2009 DVD and Blu-ray release by, uh, by Lionsgate. They reinstated three minutes of excised footage. That is it. And there's a couple of reasons that a lot of people talk about are the reasons why there was such an extreme cutting to My Bloody Valentine. It was suggested that Paramount Pictures were keen to remove the offending footage because there was a lot of backlash that they got from releasing Friday the 13th the previous year. And the other reason was because of the murder of John Lennon that took place in December of 1980. There would have been major backlash against movie violence in the wake of his death. So they wanted to do this kind of balancing act to not piss everybody off, basically. So without further ado, let's dive in. Let's talk about My Bloody Valentine and everything that happens in this movie. One of my favorite slashers, so I'm super happy to be going over this with you guys. Let's go. So the movie starts inside a mine shaft. We see a female miner takes off her gear in front of another miner, and the woman starts to perform a strip tease. The miner then pushes her into a mining pickaxe and effectively kills her in an opening kill scene. So you know this movie right off the bat, it's going to be intensely slasher. <laughs> We then meet Mayor Henniger, who's the mayor of the town Valentine Bluffs, <laughs> which is a uh, Canadian mining town, and it reinstates the traditional Valentine's Day dance, which had been suspended for the past 20 years. The dances had stopped 20 years prior because there was an accident in which two supervisors had left five miners in the mine so that they could attend the dance. Now, because they forgot to check the methane gas levels in the mining tunnels, there was an explosion that caused the mining tunnel to cave in and trap the miners. Harry Warden was the only survivor from this accident. He then resorted to cannibalism to survive and went insane from the whole ordeal that he experienced. The next year, he murdered the two supervisors who had left their posts the previous year and didn't check the methane gas levels. He did this by cutting out their hearts and placing them in Valentine candy boxes which is a pretty creative way to get a point across, if you ask me. With these boxes, he also left a note warning the town never to hold the Valentine's Day dance ever again, or he's going to commit more killings. Of course, you know, they, they placed the guy in an insane asylum, <laughs> and the accident was completely forgotten. It's been 20 years since, so of course now at this point they're looking to get the Valentine's Day dance resumed. A group of young residents at Valentine Bluffs they're super excited about the dance. And we have Sarah, Axel, and the mayor's son, TJ, who are currently involved in a tense love triangle. Mayor Hanniger and the town's police chief, Jake Newby, they both receive an anonymous box of Valentine chocolates, which contains a human heart, along with a note that murders will begin if the dance proceeds. That same evening, we meet the resident Mabel, who's murdered by a mining-geared killer in a laundromat, and her heart is removed. The police chief publicly reports that she died of a heart attack because he's trying to prevent panic happening from within the town. He contacts the mental institution where Harry Warden had been incarcerated, but they actually have no record of him. So the mayor and the police chief, they cancel the dance. They're done with this. They're not risking the lives of everybody in town. But the town's youngsters decide that they're not going to let anything get in the way of getting down and dirty and doing the Valentine's Day dance, if you know what I mean. They decide that they're going to hold their own party at the mine. A bartender, though, warns them against it, but he gets killed by the miner while trying to set up a dummy miner to scare the group. Oh, the irony. Trying to scare somebody with a miner and then get killed by the miner. Gotta love the irony. They're having a Valentine's Day party down in the mine when the miner shows up. 
the mysterious killer that's been going around murdering everybody. He brutally kills Dave. And Dave's heart is then found boiling in a pot of hot dogs that uh, was being prepared in the kitchen. Shortly after, Sylvia gets impaled on a shower head by the miner. And when the others realize that Dave and Sylvia have been murdered, that's when they decide they're going to contact authorities. But unfortunately, several of the people that were going to be attending the party have already decided they're going to enter the mines and get the party started. The police chief rushes into the mines with other police officers trying to rescue them. However, the miners got other plans. He impales a large drill into Mike and Harriet, then shoots a nail gun into Hollis's head. This totally scares the crap out of people, so they start fleeing. The remaining four who are still alive, they try to climb to the top of the mine with a ladder. They end up finding a beheaded Howard. <laughs> so they're finding dead body parts all over the mine while they're trying to get out. Now at the same time, while they're finding their way out, Axel ends up drowning and Patty is killed by the miner. The miner then chases TJ and Sarah when a fight ensues. The miners revealed that it was Axel this whole time. He didn't drown, he had actually faked his demise. Then we see a flashback sequence that shows Axel's father was one of the supervisors that was killed by Harry Warden. And as a child, Axel had witnessed Harry Warden murdering his father and tearing out his heart. Which obviously, that's a traumatizing experience for, for any child to have to go through. So this was the motivations behind his killings. TJ then hits Axel with a rock, which results in the tunnel collapsing, and traps Axel inside as the police chief and other officers arrive to rescue TJ and Sarah. Chief Newby then reveals that Harry Warden had actually died five years earlier. TJ and Sarah hear a rescuer shout that Axel's actually still alive, so they end up rushing back to the scene. They watch as Axel ends up freeing himself from the debris by amputating his trapped arm. He runs deeper into the mine, he starts shouting threats out that he and Harry Warden are going to return, and they're going to cause havoc and murder everyone in town, and then mumbles something about Sarah being his bloody valentine. The film ends with Axel laughing maniacally as a ballad for Harry Warden plays over the film's credits. Obviously, you know, being a movie that's a horror movie, it's a slasher, and it was produced in the 80s, it is going to have that level of camp to it. Like, it is going to be somewhat campy at the end of the day, but it's a really good testament of what 80 slasher films were like in that day, specifically indie ones. Like, I know this one didn't have an indie budget, and I know this, you know, made millions of dollars, so it's not necessarily an indie horror movie, but it is one of those cult classic horror movies. It's, it's not as popular as Halloween or Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street, Texas Chainsaw. It's not the Mount Rushmore of horror movies, but in terms of holiday-style movies, I feel like it's up there. I feel like it's definitely, at least in the top five, best holiday-themed movies, even though it's a Valentine's Day one. I loved it. The kills were great. The acting, obviously, was camp, and it was kind of B, but it's a good B movie. And the setting, atmosphere, everything that just engulfs you when you're watching this movie, it truly feels like you're watching a classic 80s slasher campy film. So if you're in the mood for a film like that, I encourage you, please, check out My Bloody Valentine definitely one I would add to that 80s camper slasher awesomeness. And that wraps us up for episode two on season two of the Cabin of Horrors podcast. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in and checking it out. I super appreciate it. Hope you all had an awesome Christmas. Hope you're going to have an even better new year. And I will be back again next week with another movie and another one from 1980. Two movies, bada boom. <laughs> I am your host, the incredible Josh. And until next week, see you in the shadows.